Hello, everyone. Welcome for another week of uh, Real Speaks Weekly Current Events Show. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We've got a lot in this show that we're going to be covering. It's going to be jam-packed with links and stuff that's going on in the news this week and also some things from the past as well because we want to be able to cover explanations as to why things are happening with the way that they're happening. Yes. So on this show, we'll be covering the Chinese Communism Trade Wars, U.S. business kowtowing communist China. An explanation of the friction between communism, liberalism, socialism versus Christianity. Because we want to make sure that people understand exactly why this is such a problem right now. Mm-hmm, yeah. uh, the PG&E California fires. Yeah, those are happening. That's, that's going to be very interesting. Also, uh, real climate change that's been censored. The Grand Solar Minimum. Yeah, and Tavon's done a ton of research on that as well. We've been following that for a while, and it might be really surprising. So that's the, the real climate change. Mm-hmm. But we're also going to be covering uh, fake yeah. climate crisis. Right, propaganda paid zealots and the truth behind the uh, Extinction Rebellion protests. And all of this in relation to the Green New Deal and Agenda 2030. Mm-hmm. So we've got quite the show prepared for you. Buckle up and <laughs> enjoy the ride, folks. And before we get started, we just wanted to let you guys know about some of our products and our websites. Uh, we've written a book called Forbidden Tech, and you can you can check out that book. We have it on sale right now, forbiddentech.website is the site to go to. And the book is about many topics, including free energy, patents, political scandals, murders, and cover-ups, engineering basics, cars that run on water, surveillance, gang stalking, energy weapons, and viable solutions to protecting yourself against them. We've cut out all the fluff and brought you right to the heart of the matter. Forbidden Tech, it comes in an ebook mm-hmm. for $9.99, an audio book. Uh, we actually read the book out loud. So yeah, yeah. to bring the, the story to life, nice, nice to listen to on a long car drive, right? Yeah. Um, and also we have a video course as well and a printed book on Amazon. Also, we want to tell you about our EMF protection products for home decor. We make all these products ourselves by hand. These are orgone energy products that help to uh, shield you and protect you against the harmful effects of EMF. That's right. And so we have all kinds of products. Um, if you can't sleep at night, uh, if you need a rest, we have our sleeping pods. Those are quite popular. You can have them on you. You can carry it with you. If you need a rest in a hotel and they're on the go, we have phone shields that you can slap onto any of the um, smart smartphone devices, your laptops, your router. Uh, all of our Oregon uh, products contain the shungite powder with the fuller rain, so uh, they all transform the fields uh, that, that are incoming from the environment. The shungite has also been used uh, to prevent beehive collapse because of these uh, special properties it has in transforming these harmful electromagnetic fields, thus not killing the bees anymore. And so we have this kind of technology in all of our products, so we have pendants also. Um, we have special offers for our, uh, our, our plates, for our charging plates that you use to preserve the food in your fridge longer. Your food lasts longer when you have these plates in your fridge or freezer. And also we have the pyramids to surround your property or put in your garden. Uh, you know, uh, the law of organic gardeners have been using uh, the orgone-based devices to help increase the growth and the sprouting of, of, uh, of their crops. And uh, so we're glad to be offering specials for that as well. And we've got over 2,000 customers mm-hmm. all over the world. Worldwide shipping is included with all of our prices and our special offers. And we've gotten some amazing feedback on these products. And we just love making them yeah. and spreading them to people in need. It's so. a labor of love. And all of our uh, packages come tracked as well. And you can check out our EMF protection products at ftwproject.com. Also notice that we have a chat feature on the site. So if you wanted to uh, get in touch with us, you can always chat with us on the website as well. And last but certainly not least, because we want to uh, go over some energy-related things in this show, we want to tell you about our Clean Energy Academy. We are engineers and scientists in our family, and we run an online engineering academy. We have live calls twice a month and all kinds of engineering information, schematics, reports, details, guest, guest, guest speakers. 
Um, this is around things like free energy, alternative energy, uh, different types of things, most of which is suppressed yeah. from mainstream. So we have a great time at the Academy, and you can go and check us out there at the cleanenergyacademy.com. All right, so last week, um, this was in the news. Something big happened with the NBA. One of their players tweeted one tweet <laughs> that was supporting the protests in Hong Kong. And as a result of that, all hell broke loose in the NBA world. China banned the NBA games, all sorts of things. An increasing number of U.S. lawmakers voiced anger on Monday over NBA's response to a Houston Rockets official's tweet backing Hong Kong democracy protest raising U.S.-China tensions as talks to end a 15-month trade war resume. Now, this is a Reuters article. National Basketball Association, NBA, which has built a huge following and a burgeoning business in China, said in a statement it regretted the remarks by Houston Rockets general manager Daryl Morey. A Chinese language version seemed to go further with the league saying, quote, extremely disappointed in Morey's inappropriate remarks. That prompted a torrent of criticism in U.S. political circles with a number of U.S. senators uh, excoriating the league for what they saw as a willingness to allow China to censor free speech and trample other American values for the sake of profit. And listen to this. So the NBA wants money and the Communist Party of China is asking them to deny the most basic of human rights. Senator Ben Sass of Nebraska said in a statement, in response, the NBA issued a statement saying money is the most important thing. And we'll stop it there because that was the biggest thing. There, how much money is involved in this? I don't know. Millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. Hundreds of millions of dollars of money that the NBA gets from China. Yes. Okay, so the NBA is a big business. These guys are paid millions each mm -hmm, mm -hmm. for all the players. It's a huge business. And China is supplying a giant chunk of that budget. Um, they are also, it, the, the thing is that the story goes on. There, there's been dialogue since the initial uh, tweet from this uh, official. Um, you know, with the NBA, the, 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 the executives of the NBA, the leadership in the NBA is saying, you know, we're, they're not a political uh, body uh, and, you know, that, that it doesn't represent the views of the NBA. Um, at the same time, uh, they, they've, they've had to, con you know, to, to talk about uh, or defend uh, uh, you know, traditional American values as, as, as something that the NBA uh, is going to maintain. Now, what's interesting about this, this whole story here is that at the same time, the NBA players themselves, they, they, they want to play in China as, uh, for the pre-league. They want, they want to go. Um, you know, and obviously, the players, they get, uh, they get a lot of uh, money going to China. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So what we're seeing here is a, an example of trying to serve two masters. You know, these are Americans, this is an American game, and they're, t they're getting their funding from communist China. Yes. And th there's a huge clash here. Yes. We're going to see there's some more businesses, mm -hmm. uh, American, U.S. businesses, that have the same sort of clash that are, that's happening right now. So it's really yeah. heating up. Especially in the entertainment and uh, it's, you know, sports media entertainment industry. Here's another article from Breitbart talking about how the ESPN caves to China, silence hosts on Hong Kong protests. So ESPN warned hosts to avoid any political discussion of the relationship between China and Hong Kong as the NBA continues trying to make amends with the communist nation after Rockets GM Daryl Morey tweeted support for Hong Kong's pro-democracy movement on Friday. So this kind of, it rolled out, it played out, and it's, it's been happening still. Um, but it was kind of interesting watching all of the NBA players mm -hmm. um, talk about it on different news clips. But here's another example of a U.S. company that is bending the knee to communist China. Uh, Tiffany, the, the Tiffany company, removes an advert over Hong Kong controversy. Okay, so even from China, yeah. they're getting big businesses to censor Mm -hmm. the speech that they have just you know well this because, is a fashion industry yeah and there's also a spanish um fashion industry is a, a spanish fashion company as well mm -hmm. that is also 
you know, kowtowing and changing their adverts and change and censoring themselves because of because they don't want to offend China, because they don't want to lose Chinese money. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. So in, in this one here, this is uh, Tiffany and Company has removed a tweet showing a woman covering one eye after Chinese consumers accused the jeweler of supporting the Hong Kong protesters. The photo posed on Monday showed Chinese model uh, wearing a Tiffany ring. Here's here's the tweet. Okay, mm -hmm. and so this apparently offended them. Wow. <laughs> okay. It offended them, and they apologized. It says, uh, Tiffany spokesman said the image was created in May before the protest erupted, and it, it in no way intended to be a political statement of any kind. We regret that it may be perceived as such, and in turn have removed the image from our digital and social media channels and will discontinue its use effective immediately. I don't even understand why this was so offensive to China, but it doesn't matter yes. because they didn't like it. And Tiffany bent the knee to China and said, we will do whatever you want because we, want, we don't want to lose your Chinese money. We don't care yes, yeah. if, you have, if you have communism mm -hmm. in your country. And you know, we're going to talk about how awful yes. that communism is. Here's an interesting article. It's a little bit older. Uh, this comes back from February, but did you know that China bought Reddit? I didn't know until I heard recently. <laughs> yeah. So Reddit confirms a 300 million Series D led by China's Tencent at $3 billion value. This is the interesting paragraph. Mm -hmm. The deal makes an odd pairing between one of the architects of China's great firewall of censorship and one of America's most lawless free speech forums. Yes, yeah. Some Redditors are already protesting the funding by trying to post content that would rile Chinese's uh, internet watchdogs by Im uh, imagery from Tiananmen Square and Winnie the Pooh memes mocking Chinese president. So, so here's the thing. China bought one of America's most lawless free speech platforms. Yeah, so it was thought. It. So it was thought. I mean, that that the company Reddit is is uh, lawless free speech, but not anymore. It's a, it's a <laughs> platform, and platforms, as we have experienced with the internet censorship in recent years, uh, turn coat. <laughs> now we're still going to go back in time because we want to establish the history. Actually, this came out in September, so it's uh, September 2018. So this was last year, but. All of this fake news stuff and mm -hmm. censorship, the censorship we're seeing now is a result. First, they said it's all fake news. Then we're going to censor fake news, yeah. the big tech companies. Well, China was supporting this. China yes. was behind this last year. Here's an article. Fake news is in the eye of the beholder. China is centralizing efforts to stop online rumors. So we'll read a, a bit of this, and you'll see that this is what they did in China first. And here we are a year later. And you know that's exactly what's happening right now on the big tech platforms. What is also interesting is that the, the word fake news is being used globally. So listen to this. This is a significant step for China where any piece of information that does not come from official government channels can be considered a rumor. Since 2012, Chinese authorities have undertaken a series of measures and campaigns to control online speech. Major social media platforms have been forced to implement co uh, community rules and reporting systems intending to curb the spread of rumors and false information. In September 2013, an official rumor rule was issued under which high-profile internet users could face up to seven years in prison for posting unverified information if it were viewed 5,000 times or shared more than 500 times. Thus limiting internet usage. Okay. Limiting usage, limiting what you can say. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it started there, and I think we're starting to see that mm -hmm. in the U.S. Definitely. I mean, we've we've heard about how the big tech companies—they've all moved over to China. They're mm -hmm. all working in China. They're all set up over there. Yeah, yeah. Right, and this this is you know the, the Google, the Facebook, the mm -hmm. YouTube, the Twitter. They're all over there, working over there, and China is centralizing their efforts. To censor yes. it, and it's it's definitely. I don't feel like we have free speech anymore. It's definitely well, not when using those squashed. platforms. Not when using those platforms, exactly. and and this model that China is adopting is being exported to the West. 
And here's another one. We're going back even further in time now. China on U.S. fake news debate. We told you so. And this is the Chinese state media is weighing in on the fake news debate in the U.S., saying the controversy and its possible impact on the election outcome only serves to bolster Beijing's case when it comes to controlling the Internet. So they've been telling us, and, it, you know, in this one here, um, they have the Chinese leader, like, mm-hmm. you know, celebrating uh, the crackdown on fake news, celebrating the censorship that they're seeing happening in America. Yeah. Right. So, uh, you know, that's, there's, there's a lot to be said there. So there's a background behind all of this. All right, so, but this just came out. This is a new thing. And this is from uh, the Daily Mail. Chinese citizens must pass a facial recognition test to use the Internet as part of Beijing's social credit system. So why don't we just read through a few of these highlights here? Yeah, I mean, you have the citizens in China must have their faces scanned to have the Internet installed. Uh, the rules are part of China's social credit system and will take effect on the 1st of December. Uh, the authority claimed that the move could help improve the nation's Internet security, right, and that China has been building the world's most powerful facial recognition system. And the nation's due to be equipped with uh, 626 million, million CCTV cameras by 2020. Now, this is a really big deal, Mm -hmm. and they're actually already starting to test this system in the U.S. Yes. And I will show you because I I found it. Um, They've been rolling it out Mm -hmm. in the U.S. through TSA. So this is the Wall Street Journal. Are you ready for facial recognition at the airport? Airlines and TSA are starting to scan faces to get people through security and boarding faster as privacy advocates warn of unintended consequences. You know, travelers have to face a new reality. Their faces are rapidly becoming their IDs and boarding passes at airports. So if this is talking about facial recognition. It's rolling out. Uh, in America, just as it is all over China, and it's being used to police the public. Yes. And it's it's scary. And this is one of the reasons why it's scary, because they're using the social credit system to ban things like traveling. So here's an article from The Guardian. China bans 23 million people from buying travel tickets as part of their social credit system. People accused of social offenses blocked from booking flights and train journeys. All right, so it's, they've blocked millions of discredited travelers from buying plane or train tickets as part of the country's controversial social credit system aimed at improving the behavior of citizens. Now, this is something to take note of because as we get further on through our show, mm-hmm. we're going to show you there's a connection because there are apps being developed to do something similar around the climate crisis. They're creating an app to monitor your carbon footprint so that they can penalize you or police you um, if you don't have a small enough carbon footprint. So stay tuned towards the end when we get to that part of our show. But this is already happening in China and you know, I watched a few specials on this. There was um, there was a, a show on YouTube talking about what the credit system's like, and it shows the the, the discredited people. You also have the Uyghurs. Mm-hmm. Um, they're they're Muslims that are in China, and they're all being they're having their faces scanned, and they're being penalized and and persecuted, and persecuted and tortured. And tortured. It's awful what's happening there, um, and it's part of this system as well. And it's it's part of the communist regime, and it's happening in the U.S. Um, you know, I, I knew of a company that developed this software, you know, it's a very real thing and uh, it's a scary road and it's, it's not good. People think, oh, it's more convenient. No, it's not. And I'm looking at this and I'm watching these shows and I'm thinking about how it's very difficult, um, for these, for these people to buy anything. And I'm like, you know what? That's a lot like the credit score. You know, this is much worse. It's worse, the social credit score, but it's, it's, you know, it's already sort of happened in America with the credit scores. Like you can't buy a car, you can't rent a house, you can't do mm-hmm. anything yeah. if you have a bad mark on your credit record from yes. six years ago, let's say. Yes. You know? And a lot of people have bad credit scores due to things like student loans mm-hmm. 
or uh, a bankruptcy or medical bills is a big one. You know, you get sick and you get a medical bill for a couple hundred thousand dollars, you can't pay it. You end up with a bad credit score and now you're like blacklisted from life. Well, it's like the credit score um, usurps your, your rights as a, as a citizen in that country. And that's what we're seeing here. All right, so now I want to get into communism in general because let's be honest, mm -hmm. not everybody, especially those in the younger generations, understands what communism actually is. They don't know the history behind communism. A lot of people have been, um, they have not been taught the real history about around communism. They don't understand where it comes from. Yes, yeah. they just They just hear this term, communism, and it's like, what does that even mean? Mm -hmm. What does it mean to you? Well, um, I guess what it means to me, and also it's, uh, by the way, the subject of communism is, is very, it's, it's long to, to get into it, but it, because of the history of it in the past, I want to say 150 or so years, 170 years, um, other countries have tried it on and off um, as a model for, for control of the population, mm -hmm. um, where all the resources are pulled from the individual and communities into a centralized place with the promise of everyone being equal. Um, and, and through that equality, everyone, it, 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 get, it leads people to think that everyone's treated equally. But in reality, um, you, it's left for a few oligarchs at the top to um, uh, uh, black hole all the resources for themselves, but leave the rest of the population in a um, substandard form of, uh, of existence. That's, that's why I think of communism. And that's, that's, that's a great way to describe it. And we have some more definitions that we'll bring up in a second. But here's the other thing. There's this uh, movement going on in society right now, mm -hmm. in our cultures, um, where there's all these different labels and names given to the same sort of ideal, the same sort of energy. So it's like, Communist, socialist, yeah. uh, Marxism, um, you know, all of these different isms. Yes. And it's the same sort of concept. Yeah. And they're interchangeable. So here's a great uh, way to, to define it. This is an excellent article that we'll be touching on. Um, is Marxism compatible with the Christian faith? And it actually puts some great uh, definitions in here that really help to clarify what communism is. So in this case, they're calling it Marxism, but you'll see in a second that it's interchangeable. So Marxism is a political philosophy developed by Prussian German philosopher Karl Marx that focuses on class struggle and various ways to ensure equality of outcome for all people. Marxism and Marxian an, uh, analysis have various schools of thought, but the basic idea is that the ruling class in any nation has historically oppressed the lower classes and thus social revolution is needed to create a classless homogeneous society. Marxism teaches that the best system of government is one in which wealth is distributed equally. There's no private property. Ownership of productive entities is shared by everyone and every citizen gives selflessly to the collective. The purported goal of Marxism is a government-run utopia in which the needs of each individual are always provided for. Ideally, the strong work hard, the inventive create technological marvels, the doctors heal, the artists delight the community with beauty, and anyone who is weak or poor or in need can draw on society's combined resources as their needs demand. When this idealistic model is attempted in the real world, it's called socialism, communism, hmm. statism, liberalism, or progressivism, depending on the degree to which the model is explored and implemented. I think that's a uh, well, well read article. That, that's a really great way to define what we're talking about here. But listen to the next sentence. Thus far, Marxism has never worked in real life and without exception in the places where Marxism has been the governmental model, Christians have been persecuted. Yes. We'll get more into that in a second so we can so people can understand whether you are a Christian or not, at least you should know 
why this communist, Marxist, socialist, liberalist, progressivist, whatever you want to call it, <laughs> agenda just butts heads right up against the Christian faith and why there's so much uh, controversy. And why Christians always have to be the first group to go when, it com when this kind of model comes into the society. Absolutely. So just to show you how severe this communism, this, I these, this ideology, this is a really big problem because communism communist governments are responsible for more murders than any of the wars combined yes communism here's here's uh, the black book of communism and shows you down here the estimated number of victims of all the different communist regimes and how many people have been killed so look at some of these numbers 65 million people in the people's republic of china have been murdered 20 million in the Soviet Union, 2 million in Cambodia, 2 million in North Korea, 1.7 million in Ethiopia, 1.5 million in Afghanistan, 1 million in the Eastern Bloc, 1 million in Vietnam, and 150,000 in Latin America, and 10,000 deaths resulting from actions of the international communist movement and communist parties not in power. It goes on and on and on. I think it's over. 120 million people at have the very, been murdered. At the very least. At the least have been murdered because of communist regimes and this communist ideology. So, T, I've been talking to you. I've been kind of, kind of had like a bee in my bonnet mm -hmm. about this because I was like, I don't understand. Like, what is, like, how does this start? Death. How does it go from, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, it sounds like such a good idea in the beginning. Like, everybody's mm -hmm. going to share. Yeah, yeah. There will be nobody left out. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, it turns into mass murder. What yes. happens there okay. in governmental situations? Well, I think historically, so we kind of reference in, in, in history. Um, I mean, there's all kinds of events uh, that, that, you sh that you just went through there. Um, but it tends to be a, a, a resentment of, with within the different uh, s sections of society mm -hmm. um, and this new model comes along as the promise of it will liberate you from your current lot in life mm -hmm. um, and it just goes from there uh, well yeah. they tell you that every everyone's going to be equal everyone's going to be equal right? why should you serve the russian czar why should you serve this family this decadent family that doesn't think of you when they when you go off into a war but and what they don't tell you is that being equal means you'll all be equally poor. It's, it's seen as a, a perk that you know, you're equal, you, you call each other comrade, and this understanding that you're no different than the person next to you. So, um, and anyone who sees himself as being different or, or being, uh, uh, just say, uh, elevated for, for their skills or for their work mm -hmm. or for their recognition uh, needs to be brought down, but brought down to the level of the masses. So where does the killing come in? I think the killing comes in when, when people don't accept that, especially Christians. This goes back to the Christians being persecuted in every single example where this happens. Two things happen when there's a communist takeover. Mm -hmm. um, one is that society that this ideology is going into is in the past has, been, has had some defense, guns, mm -hmm. or some kind of uh, armory. That has to go away through either legislated away and, and coerced away, or, or just sometimes just the military just goes in and just tries to disarm the population, which ends up being quite bloody. And the second thing is, again, the reason why Christians uh, tend to be, or, uh, or, or anything that has kind of like a, a society that has some form of, of like, like a religious uh, underpinning, like Christianity, or even, is, or even Muslims, too. Muslims, but I, I mean, I'm, I'm coming from, for example, mm -hmm. in a lot of these examples, it, these were nations that were Christian, um, uh, had a Christian uh, underpinning, mm -hmm. is biblically Christians work and are, uh, there's compensation for your work and you are elevated for your work um, to, to, you know, among men, you know, human beings in general, and you aspire to, to, to create feats of, feats of work. Mm -hmm. you know, to glory God. Right? Now let... Now, well, this is important because mm -hmm. this is the clash. Um, you, you don't... So, the, so, so automatically, you automatically fall outside of uh, what you... as far as being uh, like a comrade within a communist system because inevitably 
um, you'd realize right away, it doesn't matter how hard you work, your compensation within a communist system won't be based on that. And mm -hmm. at the same time, you, it, it would be an insult to see your, your work being squandered or wasted or managed because someone thinks that they can manage it better than you can. So you don't even have the opportunity to be a steward. Someone else will, 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 will claim that right. And if you don't like it, you will be shot. And that's where the violence starts. Mm. I, 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 would argue, I would argue that's where the violence starts, which is why a majority, a, lot, a large portion of the people who, who end up perishing under those regimes are Christians. Because it clashes directly with the Bible. Let's get into that. All right, we're going to go back to that article because it really did highlight some of the big clashes between communism or Marxism and the Christian faith. And we want to highlight this because I didn't know this stuff. You know, I didn't know this stuff. I, I just came back, you know, to, Tavon and I are Christians. We just came back to our Christian faith about three years ago, right? So we were raised in a Christian house, and then we, like, you know, we walked away from the faith for a while, but then we just came back about three years ago. And we started looking into the things that the Bible said, and there was stuff, there was stuff that came out that I read that I had never, I had never heard before because we weren't actually reading it for ourselves. So we want to share some of these things with our listeners, whether you are a Christian or you're not a Christian, so at least you can understand why there's such a clash right now with what's going on with communist China mm -hmm. trying to come into America, which is a Christian country, or it's supposed to be a Christian country, but it seems that a lot of the Christian ideals are just going out the window, and this is why there's such a problem. So Marxism, or communism, at the heart is an atheistic philosophy with no room for belief in God. Karl Marx himself was clear on this point. The first requisite of the happiness of the people is the abolition of religion. Okay, so right there, communists get rid of religious groups. Well, in, in fact, the religion is the worship of the government. Yes. Christianity, of course, is rooted in theism and is all about God. In the Marxist model, the state becomes the provider, sustainer, protector, the, and lawgiver for every citizen. In short, the state is viewed as God. Christians always appeal to a higher authority, the God of the universe, and Marxist governments don't like the idea of there being any authority higher than themselves. So that is a direct clash. Now, there's some teachings in Christianity um, here's an interesting thing. One of the basic tenets of Marxism or communism is that the idea of private property must be abolished. Where Marxism has taken root, landowners see their property confiscated by the state. And private ownership of just about anything is outlawed. In abolishing private property, Marxism directly contradicts several biblical principles. So the Bible assumes the existence of private property and issues commands to respect it. Thou shalt not steal. Mm -hmm. So if you've got this communist thing, because that's the thing, they'll, they'll take everything. Yes. They'll take everything from you. It's yes. like you don't own anything. You can't own anything. Yes. If you want to get equal pay and equal everything, you're, we're also going to take everything from you. So that's known as stealing. The Bible honors work and teaches that individuals are responsible to support themselves. I'm going to read the King James Version of this. I didn't know that the Bible said this, and when I read it, it blew my mind. This was Paul, and they were uh, traveling around, preaching the gospel, and there was all these groups of disciples mm -hmm. staying in other people's houses, yeah. and people were putting them up and feeding them meals, and... The, the concept there was, we're not just going to come and mooch off of you. Yes. It's like we need to earn our way. Yes. We while, need yeah. While we're here spreading the gospel, for the time we're here, mm -hmm. um, we'll work with our hands at whatever capacity it is. Right. Right. And so, so this is what Paul said. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. That's a good motivation to work, isn't it? <laughs> that, that spits in the face 
of this communist free lunch yes. thing that's going on right now. You've got all of these people that are just, you know, they don't work. If you don't work, you shouldn't eat. Now let's 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 go here. Let's go here mm-hmm. now because let's talk about the welfare benefits system. Right. That the Western world is completely it's a crutch. Yes. There are millions and millions of people that are on benefits, on government handout checks, and it's not always everybody's fault. Sometimes, you know, you get disabled, things happen, there's no jobs. Well, you got the economy. Uh, the economy is, 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 is going crazy, so, like, you know, nobody can find work. People can't earn a living anymore, so yeah. there are so many people that are on these government handout checks because it's by design yes. to keep you under the clutches of the system. Because when you're on a, when you, when you're on a government check, mm-hmm. you live in fear. Mm. Fear of what? Fear that any moment, anything that you do, they'll stop sending your check. Mm. They'll cut off your checks. You won't get that check every week or every month or whatever. So you better not say something they don't like on social media. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You better not, uh, you know, you, you better not show that you're working and earning money because that, that's a big one, yeah. you know, especially in the U.S. It's like if sometimes th- they'll give you a, a check with free money that's just enough to barely squeak by. And they tell you, if you go get a job and you make this much, we'll take away your check. And sometimes the money you could earn at a job, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. take home after taxes, is less money than your free check from the government. So there's no easy transition point. Where's the incentive, right? So we've got this huge population of people because of the economy that they did by design Mm -hmm. when they started uh, printing money out of thin air, creating inflation, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. putting everybody in debt up to their eyeballs that nobody could ever pay off. So they created this horrendous situation. Now we have millions of people living off of of government checks. Yes. And then you've got a verse like this. If you don't work, you don't eat. Yes. How do you reconcile that? Yeah, is the Bible your authority? Is the Bible your authority? Is the Word of God your? Is your faith? Is your belief in God your authority, or is the state your God? And in a case like this, you think about it. Just yes. think about it. Is the state your God? Mm-hmm. And one more um, clash with communism and Christianity and the teachings uh, that we're going to highlight here is when Jesus talked about the parable of the talents. So we're actually going to read through the parable of the talents and explain it a little bit so you can see that there's no way to reconcile communism, Marxism, socialism, progressivism with the parable of the talents. It it cancels it out. Okay, so you'll see that in just a moment. Okay, this is the parable of the talents from the King James Version. This is Matthew 25, verse 14 through 30, and these are the words of Jesus. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one. To every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought another five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. He's got a prophet. (laughs) <laughs> Great. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. 
Then he which hath received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that thou art a hard man reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering thou where thou hast not strawn. And I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth. Lo, there thou hast that is thine. His Lord answered and said unto him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knowest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not strawed. Thou oughtest therefore to have put my money into the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received my own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it to him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away from even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So we just read through the parable of the talents. When I first read it, it didn't make sense to me. So let me just try to paraphrase it in my own way. Um, there's a master. He's the, he's the owner of the land. He goes away on a long journey. While he's gone, he's got three different servants. And he gives to each of them a talent. Now, a talent is like money. Yes. That's why they call it talents. Yeah. Um, it's what you would earn in exchange for a talent that you had. Mm -hmm. So it's like a coin or a, a measure of money. So he gives them a measure of money according to their ability. Okay, right there, <laughs> that takes equal pay and oh. knocks, you know, knocks it out of the ballpark. It's like, why would you pay somebody um, more mo the, the same amount of money for more skill? than somebody who doesn't have that like skill. Universal income. Right. It's it's it there's no universal income here. In the Bible. Yes. Okay? The master gave them talents according to their ability. Yes. And so one of them went away and did the best that he could and he took what what was given to him and he turned it into a profit. Yeah. And he came back and when the master came back he said, Look, I made a profit mm -hmm. off of what you gave me. And the second guy said, Look, I made a profit yeah. off of what you gave me. I right. used my personal skills in order to take what you gave me and turn it into something, right. create something from it. But the third one said that he was afraid. So fear. For whatever reason, the guy was afraid, and he didn't do anything. He didn't turn it into profit. He took it, and he buried it. It's like he stuck it under the mattress. He, he hoarded. He hoarded it. Right. He buried it, and he hoarded it. Now, this can go really deep, and we yes, will... On, on different levels. It can go really deep, because if you take context into this, yeah. at that time in history, when a master of the land went out on these long journeys and voyages, sometimes they wouldn't come back. Yes. They would be out at sea, they'd get lost at sea, shipwrecked, and the master wouldn't come back. And if that was the case, then when the master didn't come back, that talent that was given to that servant, he wouldn't have been able to steal it. And there'd be no record of it. That's why he buried it. Yes. That's why Jesus said here, it would have been better if you put my if you put the talent in the bank. Yes. Because at least I could have made some interest on it. Yes, that's right. And I could have, when I got back, gotten my talent back. But instead, you buried it in the ground, so there was no record of who it belonged to. But the point here, towards the end, and like like I said, this gets really deep because it it goes on and on. You can really dig into this. At the end, he says that he was wicked yes. and unprofitable. And slothful. Slothful. Lazy. You yes. know, you lazy, wicked, unprofitable servant. So somebody that doesn't do any work to try, yes. to, tr to try to create a profit. And then he says, you know, <laughs> cast ye... Into outer darkness there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And where Jesus talks about weeping and gnashing of teeth, he's referring to hell. Yes. So the wicked, lazy, unprofitable servant is going to hell. He's cursed to hell. He's cursed to hell. Why would he be cursed to hell? Because the master knows that the reason why he hid the talent is because he was, the servant was hoping that the master would die. Yes, he wasn't so thinking about the master. So that he could steal it from him. That's right. Right? So this... You can't see, see, you see all the stuff that's going on here. You can't take these beliefs, this belief here. Because yes. this is what Christians believe, at least the ones that follow what the Bible says. There's <laughs> Christians that don't get this and they just listen to some preacher that might be, you know, a wolf in sheep's clothing leading mm -hmm. people astray. 
And we've heard preachers that actually somehow say that this passage has nothing on any, any level have anything to do with, with money. money. Yeah. It's oh, mind okay. Bottom. Yeah. Wow. No, no, this passage has everything to do with money. And okay? more. And more. We're going to do a special report on this one time um, talking about prosperity gospel versus poverty gospel. Poverty gospel. Because yeah, there's the, two. The, bro, the broke hippie Jesus. Uh, okay. Yeah, the broke hippie Jesus, exactly. Because he wasn't, Jesus was not a broke hippie. Casting locks over his clothes, okay. Yeah, so, but anyway, um, so this was this was a really interesting thing. This, in the face of communism, you, it doesn't, it's it doesn't work. It's incompatible. You can't fit something like this parable into um, the mindset of a communist. Now, I just want to say as a side note here that when I'm surfing online and I start seeing people making YouTube videos or or complaining about how, oh, those people raised some money on some crowdfunding campaign or oh they're 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 creating a product or service and they're charging people money for it. Like mm. they get there's these these socialists communist trolls. Anonymous ones. The anonymous ones, they get angry when other people are trying to create some kind of small business for themselves mm -hmm. so that they can work and provide a product or a service that's of value to another human being yes. in exchange for money so they could pay their bills and feed their family. And I must also say this is how um, humans have existed on this planet since the very beginning. Like the, the, par the parable we just read out of the Bible, you know, there was no uh, capitalism or any kind of ism during those days. It was just, what is your business and can I sell something to you? Would you like to buy something that I have on my stall? That is it. So that's why when I get trolled and harassed online and they, they immediately bring up something that relates to them being bitter over the fact that maybe every now and then we might make some money at our business and sell a product. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh, commie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, can, I can mark them out. They're communists and they're, they're part of this, this, this regime, this agenda that's going on. Yes. And you see it on a much bigger scale between China and the trade wars. Yeah, but on a smaller scale, uh, we see uh, like other friends of ours, people we know, who also are trying to, you know, like uh, have, run a business, so they have some online presence, and they too get trolled uh, just for just for just having the business online. It's amazing. This was just sent to me today, so we just covered like that. This ideology it comes from like an atheist background. Um, the 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 state is your god, and yes. you know, but I I don't I don't believe that there is no god. Yeah. I believe it's you're on one side or the other. Mm -hmm. You're either on God's side or the enemy's side. And there is an enemy. It's the, the, the antichrist, if you will. You know, the anti-God. And I think that's what's in charge of this communism, socialism spirit that we see invading our culture right now. And it's shown, check this out, just to see the behaviors. This is an article um, put out just today, October 14th, <clears throat> this is reactions to my tweet reveal the ignorant brutality of young socialists and communists. It's written by Mike Gonzalez. I'm going to read some of it. An eye-opening social experiment unfolded on my Twitter feed over the past several days that reveals a lot about America's new brand of young communists and socialists. So he says, here's what happened on October 1st the 70th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. That is, the day the communist rule was formalized over the planet's most populous country, I sent out this tweet. And it's a tweet that shows um, someone executing a landowner in China. It says, a landlord murdered at the start of the People's Republic of China. Nothing to celebrate in 70 years of communism. Right. Right? This is what we just talked about. Yeah, ownership. Ownership and, you know, landlords being shot, you know, to, to take over their lands, stealing, murder. Okay, so listen to this. The tweet, as you can see, depicts the cruelty that communists visit upon the societies they take over. It has always been thus, and he goes through all the different communist regimes. But he says, at first, I got supportive tweets. Some were friends who have suffered personally from Marxism and lived to tell about it. 
He talks about the, you know, the, the positive supportive tweets that he got. And he goes, then something began happening that initially left me puzzled and bemused and then a little bit sad when I realized what it meant about some members of our present generation of youth. Right. Thousands, no exaggeration, thousands of retweets and mentions began to pour in from young socialists and communists celebrating the murdering of landlords, bemoaning that a good bullet was wasted when rocks abounded, and even some telling me I was next. And he's showing pictures of all of these, these socialists, communists, libtard, progressive crazies that are on the internet, Killing all landlords is the best thing Mao ever thought of, L-M-A-O, right? And then he says, my notifications began to blow up with these chilling messages throughout the day, and it hasn't stopped. Just then, I think the users, just when I think the users had finished, a new cycle will pick up in the middle of the night and continue through the early morning and afternoon. It's from around the globe, too. One reason I was initially bemused is that most of the tweets are utter drivel. The memes these socialists employed were infantile, like this one with the little dog dancing because landlords were murdered, revealing a generation that has spent way too much time in front of video games and not enough reading books like Animal Farm or better yet, Lord of the Flies. <laughs> they celebrated that they had owned me because you know, ratio, in quotations. So there's a bunch of tweets of all of these brutal people. And it was thousands upon thousands. Just going on a little bit more here. He says their responses not only revealed an alarming disregard for human life, they were also utterly ignorant of economics. An important theme was the supposed parasitic nature of landowners. This exposes yet again that they have not been taught the useful function of people who own and upkeep property so that those who cannot own it can have a place to live. Or perhaps it exposed that too ma far too many socialists have never met a landlord because they are all living in their mother's basement. Hard to say for sure. But of course, they would never have concluded that the very nature of owning anything was good because they opposed the very concept of ownership to begin with. That was another of the themes that emerged in this exercise. Too many of our hipster socialists, all property is theft. And there you have it. There you have it. So this is what we're dealing with. This is the issue that we're dealing with. And very quickly, we're just going to touch on these trade wars with China and tie this all in. There's been trade negotiations going on um, between Trump and China, and it's kind of like this little game. It's like, I'm going to put trade, uh, trade wars on you and basically make it really expensive for Chinese products to come into the U.S. and put a huge tax on Chinese products. And the China says, please, can you just wait a little while because they, they had something going on. So Trump's like, oh, I'll delay it a little bit longer. And then it's like, we're going to make a deal and we're, you know, we're, we're not going to have the big taxes. And then it's like, but not really because China makes deals all the time, but they never come through with them. They're notorious for saying they're going to do something and then they don't actually do it. So here's the gist of that whole thing. Um, I'm looking at this and I heard somebody else say, oh, you know, it's going to be really bad because it's a tax on the American people. Now, let me give you another perspective on this, right? Because we were sitting on the beach, T, and mm -hmm. we were like, well, wh what's really going on here with this, with this trade war stuff? Right. Yeah. And I concluded that you've got this communist country that has been doing things like organ harvesting, mm -hmm. persecuting and killing Christians, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, their people are living under, like, lock, you know, under their slaves pretty yeah. much right it's a digital it's, lockdown a digital lockdown and it's it's you know it's a lot of bad things going on right but they're selling all their stuff to america so mm -hmm. we have i mean just think about it, all of your stuff it's, it all comes from china like all the walmart stores mm -hmm. would go out of business if they can't get cheap chinese stuff right right all the target stores would mm -hmm. go out of business we were talking to a friend of mine who vapes, and it's like, 
Where's your vape mate? Because there's vape wars going on right now. Yeah. You know, they're like, they're, <laughs> they're outlawing vaping in all these different places. Um, and it's like, well, where's the vape come from? Oh, all the vapes, I mean, the liquid, the juice is made in, in uh, America in mm -hmm. some places, but the equipment, the technology, yeah. the device itself, that's all coming from Shenzhen, China. Yeah, yeah just, just look at the, your brand, look it up online. Look it up. Find out where your company right? is so making them. Are the vape wars about the vaping or are they about the Chinese trade? Uh, the Chinese hardware. Yeah, the Chinese hardware. I mean, it's so I'm like, well, what's going on here? Why are all these taxes being put on Chinese goods? And if you think about it, the only way that you can get people to stop buying cheap Chinese crap is to stop making it cheap. Yes. So if you go into a store and you see the, the, the thing that used to be the, the cheap Chinese thing is now 10 times more expensive than the American made or the, mm -hmm. you know, uh, European made thing, mm -hmm. you're going to buy the cheaper thing. That's the only way to stop this, this industry, this trade that's going on. So it's not, oh, it's just taxing the Americans. It's, it's deeper than that. It's, it's like somebody had to do this to stop it. Yes. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's it's just a complicated issue uh, all around because it's this has been a, a problem that's several decades in the making. Uh, globalists, uh, Western globalists, have taken the infrastructure from the West and moved it to the East. Um, and really, the ingenuity, anything from ingenuity to patents, and all the kind of intellectual innovation over the past decade, uh, several decades, has gone eastward and it has metastasized and basically um, the West is just sucked dry. Um, now, now what's happened is China is, is selling, this, selling these products now um, and the wealth and prosperity of China isn't just from the things that have happened there through its own innovation. It's been largely because of the Western globalist uh, infrastructure that China was given. And that flywheel effect is what we're seeing. It's not because of the communist regime. It's because of, of all of the resources going into building that country up. And what we're seeing is, uh, is just the end chapter of, of, of this whole thing playing out. You know, all the stuff that was going westward has stopped. And now um, the economies are just collapsing all over the place. And people are, and, and, and Everyone's trying to look for a solution on how to correct this. Where are you going to buy? Where are you going to sell? You know, to, to go with this thing again about buying cheap China stuff, um, a lot of people, what they're trying to do with um, having an online market or trying to have run a business online, just give you an example, is to buy cheap things from China and sell it on Amazon or eBay for like another dollar or two dollars more. So that's their profit. Um, but then they'll have it delivered from China. Um, and, and there's a lot of people, especially younger people, trying to do this as an online business opportunity. But see, what you're doing is you're actually you're aiding in the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, the problem in America, it, in most countries, it, they, they have to have some kind of protection like policy, like a tariff or, or, or value added tax to import products, especially from countries if, if the products that are coming in are disruptive. America needs to have that with China. They need to have some kind of uh, 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 like a, a VAT or some kind of tariff for, for key things coming in from China. Um, you're talking about vaping, for example. I mean, we, looked, we actually looked it up with our friend, and it was kind of astonishing that it was in Shenzhen. The, vape, the actual vape technology itself mm -hmm. was made in Shenzhen. And in, in that example, um, you'd have to support American-made vapes, for example. Yeah. You, you, you know. Is there an American company that actually makes vapes? And I'm not talking about get the Chinese parts and you put it together and, and put the U.S. sticker on it. I mean, is there an American company that actually takes American steel, makes the part for the vape, and makes the vape and right. puts made in America on it and, and sells it for cheaper than a Chinese product? Until we get to that point, and many of these other, um, especially the disruptive technologies, uh, this is going to be a problem. And I think we can, even, even if America doesn't have gold reserves or whatever, um, it, the, the way out of that is for us to innovate our way out of this, out of this mess. Now, you, you're touching on some stuff that's really a hot topic for you and I, mm -hmm. because we're people that make things with our hands. Yes. Yeah. Right? And that's the problem that America has, is that all the industry left. Yeah. It was all taken out of the country and, and brought, brought overseas, and now you've got 
people that don't know how to make things with their hands anymore. The, you know, that was a great way to put it. You have to make the American vapes with American steel. Yes. That's a big deal. When you're trying to make something and you have to get the parts shipped all over the world and assembled in one place and shipped over here and tariffs, because we've done all this in mm -hmm. our business, this is what we do. Mm -hmm. And it is a big deal. And that's going to lead us into something big that Trump did when it comes to Chinese trade. And right after he did this, all of these forests, all these fires started in California. So here's the headline. Trump rids major U.S. container port of Chinese communist control. Wow. Under a long-term deal sealed by the Obama administration, a Chinese communist company was set to control the second busiest container port in the United States. Gee, thanks, Obama. In an unreported Trump administration victory, the communists are out of a drawn-out national security review, forced a unit of China-based Costco Shipping Holdings Company, Orient Overseas Container Line, OOCL, to sell the cherished container terminal business, which handles among the largest freight of imports into the U.S. That's amazing. Bam! Wow. You are cut <laughs> off. <laughs> That's basically what just happened there. Well done. Right? It all started with a 40-year container terminal lease between the port of Long Beach in Southern California and Hong Kong. The Obama administration proudly signed the agreement in 2012, giving China control of America's second largest container port behind the nearby port of Los Angeles. One of the Trump administration's big, first big moves was to get the communists out of the port of Long Beach. After a national security review and federal intervention, the Long Beach terminal business, which handles millions of containers annually, is finally being sold to an Australian company called um, Macquarie Infrastructure Partners that essentially kills China's decades-long contract with the Obama administration. Wow. This is a big deal. Mm -hmm. And then... Right after he did this, right after this happened, the power outage and oh, in California. the fires in California, which is where this port is. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Bam. So it's like oh, that's that timing is very interesting. Yeah. That timing is very interesting. There's definitely a bigger agenda going on here. Mm -hmm. So we're keeping a close eye on what's going on with the California fires this time around because last year there were some horrible fires. There was the, the, the Camp Fire, the Paradise Fire in California that was all over the place. And PG&E mm -hmm. is the company that was responsible for those fires. Um, and let's remember that PG&E is a Rothschild-controlled company. So because of what happened last year, and all the damages. They were sued and they yeah. were they had to go bankrupt. Here's uh, PG E loses exclusive control of its bankruptcy recovery plan. They had to go bankrupt and they were so that they did and they had this plan that they were trying to roll out. But basically, um, they lost control of what they can do in the plan and what happened recently, this happened last month. PG&E agrees to pay $11 billion to settle with insurers over California wildfires. They were actually asking for $20 billion, mm -hmm. and I think the cost of the damage was $30 billion. So yes. this is a problem, right? So this happened before. They're, they're bankrupt. They're paying out all this money. And then what do they do? They shut the power off, right? This happened last week as well. The utility giant PG&E voluntarily shuts off power, could impact 800,000 California customers. People were complaining big time. But why did they shut the power off? Their statement as to why they shut it off is because of a potential widespread severe wind event forecast for Wednesday. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not buying the, the, the main storyline here. I mean, it was a little windy. Really? Right? And it was a little windy, so they shut the power off. What, what this really looked like to me 
was a power play. Yeah. It was to show the people we have control yes. over the grid and yeah. we could shut you off at any time. So if be afraid, right? People be afraid, but also if there's any other reason to uh, go off grid, this would be one of them. Yeah, I think they were testing. You know how they, they, they run these tests on mm -hmm. things like let's do um, – you know, a, a military testing operation to see what would happen in a certain case of panic or something like. So this was testing to see what would happen if they if they shut off all the power. And they did. I think it's back on right now. And there's some there's some reports that they're saying um, it's not really necessary uh, to what well, was it really necessary to shut the power off. Yeah. yeah. But it, the whole thing is very suspicious. So we're watching this very carefully mm -hmm. and we want to play you a clip actually, from SGT Report, who did a wonderful video on this, because he, um, he showed a video that someone had showing that at the time that the power went off and their fires were started, at the same time the fires broke out, mm -hmm. there were these explosions that were caught. So let's, take, let's check this out. Now, folks, here's where it gets extremely alarming. This video shared by High Impact Vlogs on his channel is from Logic Before Authority who discovered using weather radar these anomalous events, which appear to be explosions at the very same moment fires began breaking out once again in California. It's been said and known in the last little bit that there was a fire that outbroke in Sandalwood, California. It's east of LA, okay, up in the foothills, east of LA, down the valley there, basically. You can see it in the center of the screen it's two explosions that look to be about, I don't know, probably 30, 40 miles apart. There are two different fires that exploded at the exact same moment there. You can see them in the center of the screen. The only thing is, is there's, there are three more. If you look over to the right-hand side of your screen, out in front of the bubble, Right in front of the bubble, the little orange bubble on the right side of the screen. You see that one? And over there. At the yeah. exact same moment, these two other explosions take place. One on the right-hand side, and I don't know that exact location yet, explodes and takes place. Then to the north, at the exact same moment, at the state line, another explosion takes place at the exact same oh. moment. Look at that. It can be seen to the right of the screen near the orange bubble wow. straight out in front of the orange bubble down you can see the smoke plume starting to come up from it huge fire also up the valley we've got another huge explosion it's amazing he caught this yeah all simultaneous at least five explosions all at the same time I don't know what's going on in California, whether they're going to claim this is forest fires or what they're doing, but California is under attack. These are the same type of anomalies that we saw last year in the Paradise Fire event. The same anomalous explosions sparking fires. Right there. That thing, that, that projectile looking thing, that's something more than smoke. So there you have it. Those are some interesting videos, and we are definitely watching these uh, fire situations very closely, especially because it involves shutting down the power grid. That's and, and there are some ca there are casualties uh, from the last uh, fire last year. Okay, changing the topic, we are now going into the Grand Solar Minimum, or GSM. Now this is what we consider, because climate change is real. And yes. it is actually happening. It's happening on a grand scale. There are things that are going on in the news. But here's the thing. It's being suppressed mm -hmm. big time. And it's being hidden. And this is something that Tavon has spent a lot of time following. So I will let him sort of take the lead on this next part as he explains what is the grand solar minimum. Yeah, I've been following the um, man-made global warming thing for a couple of years now. Uh, and... Uh, and saw the fraud for what it was, and uh, especially coming from a, a science background. Um, and and, and only really recently, in the past uh, two years or so, have I been following some of the other researchers and scientists that have proposed an alternative theory based on uh, data pulled from 
uh, not only the geological record but also from solar activity and uh, it's called the Grand Solar Minimum and it's basically dealing with correlating the solar activity with and the solar cycle with the activity on the earth when it comes to climate change um, and so basically you may or may not be aware the sun goes through a solar cycle it's every 11 years now during that 11 year period uh, the amount of sunspots on its surface uh, just comes and goes and now also that also uh, tells you or shows you the level of uh, activity that's on the sun you have more sun sunspots during that 11 year cycle uh, it, imply, it, should, it implies there's more activity going on in the sun, meaning more energy is being sent from the sun to the earth. Okay? And during the end of that cycle, the winding down, there's less so, uh, sun, sun spots. So over 11 years, you have these change in the sunspot activity in the sun. Now, if you, every 11 year cycle, um, they're finding that the number of sunspots or the activity of the sunspots wanes. There's this larger cycle. Over a couple of cycles, it ebbs and flows. And so they have this model um, where they see these larger cycles. And sometimes they come every, uh, every, every couple of hundred years. Uh, sometimes it's every couple of thousands of years. And now only recently, when combining all the data from the magnetic uh, field from the sun, the solar activity and sunspots from the sun, and with the geographical record in the earth, and we're talking in the past, only in the past 50 years, have they been able to at least gather the data? Only recently have they been able to take that data and turn it into a reliable computer model that accurately predicts mm. the activity uh, or, or the climate of what's gonna happen roughly on the earth based on activity from the sun or more like they can model what's about to what's about to happen on the sun thus have an idea of the kind of energy that's going to hit the earth and impact the earth and what that can mean so we're talking about things like storms storms earthquakes earthquakes temperature drops temperature drops and temperature increases mm -hmm. and, and, and that, droughts. that droughts yeah. Uh, floods, and, and, yes. all these things are affected. All these this. things are affected based on this model. It's an accurate model. It's a model that, um, that, that is the most accurate model to anything else that is out there right now. Wow. And has put at least a handful of scientists on the map when it comes to this research, one of which is called Dr. Uh, Valentina Zarkova that I'm going to talk about in a moment. So having said that, we're going to start talking about the Grand Solar Minimum. There are some channels that I've been following uh, faithfully uh, uh, since I've been looking, looking in this topic. This is the GrandSolarMinimum.com. Um, it is uh, operated and, and ran uh, by a, uh, a couple out of New York, and they're amazing. Um, they have a YouTube channel called Grand Solar Minimum GSM News. and. Uh, I recommend going to this site with all kinds of uh, information dealing with the Grand Solar Minimum. Uh, they are always on top of the news globally as far as um, earth weather changes, uh, the climate. On this cover page, as you can see here, they talk about uh, these solar cycles. What is a Grand Solar Minimum? They go into the definition. They talk about the solar sunspot uh, cycle. Um, so I highly recommend you go to this website uh, to get caught up on the solar cycle and the grand solar minimum and how that plays into our climate. It's really important now because we are in solar cycle 24 um, and in a couple of years we'll be in solar cycle 25 and by some of the estimates um, from these researchers and scientists that are looking at this data um, we're actually starting to see the, the extreme changes now, but it's really supposed to kick off in the next few years. So it's time for us to really start to uh, pay attention to what's happening with our star and, um, and, and to get prepared. And because there's, yes, there's lots of news stories that are coming out that show these changes. I mean, we're talking about crazy temperature drops crazy temperature drops that were last sighted um you know a couple of hundred years ago mm -hmm. uh so just to go over it again the definition of the grand solar minimum minimum 
It occurs when several solar cycles exhibit lesser than average activity for decades or centuries. Solar cycles are still occur during these grand solar minimum periods, but are at a lower intensity. Basically, the sun's output is a bit weaker. And why does this matter, though? Because mm. it's things like food shortages. Yes, that's okay? right. If you, have, if you have cold weather, you have huge crop losses. Um, and these things are happening. And this is what we're talking about as far as it being censored. It's really hard to find the stories about these particular types of weather events that are related to the grand solar minimum and what's happening. And like an entire crop of corn got wiped out last year. That's right, in the and, Midwest, yeah, yes. And it's yeah. going to cause some serious problems. Uh, even China was mm -hmm. losing like their fruit crops and things like that. So these, these, are, these are big problems, big famines, and they're just kind of being ignored or censored. And instead, we're being distracted with tons and tons of political news. And now we're also being given this, this fake climate crisis events which right. we'll get into it in a little bit. But the reason why we're talking about this, we're going to go over this, is we're going to give you the, um, the, the, net, the real science and data as uh, this effect is a, natural, is a natural system, is a natural cycle. The grand solar minima have shown uh, to have some correlation with the global and regional climate changes. Now, there's some vocabulary that we have to learn before we go any further. One is called solar irradiance. Solar irradiance is the power per unit area uh, received from the sun in the form of electromagnetic radiation. Okay, now that's basically this the output of energy going onto the earth. And at currently it's around 1300 watts per square meter. Now if you want to calculate the total solar radiance coming from the sun, basically all the energy that's coming from the sun that the earth is absorbing, it is the most fundamental of the climate uh, parameters as it indicates the totality of the energy driving the climate system. Now that's defined by NOAA, okay? So that's on their own website. Interesting name, that's N-O-A-A. -A. Yes, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. That's their definition for total solar irradiance, um, how that energy from the sun is being absorbed by the earth and that's a fundamental climate parameter as far as the, uh, what's driving the climate system, okay? So now what we're gonna talk about is Valentina Zarkova's research. Dr. Valentina Zarkova, um, she has done some presentations dealing with uh, her research with the Grand Solar Minimum. She actually had a team of graduates uh, and other uh, uh, colleague scientists working with her to, for the past couple of years, uh, come up with a, a model uh, to describe what's happening with our sun. Uh, now she is, uh, she's prolific in this field. She has a very lengthy career. Um, um, but she's actually come up with a robust model and it's really uh, her work is being seen all over the world now because her model has been more accurate than any other model that's out there. The GrandSolarMinimum.com has actually created a crowdfund uh, uh, for, for her research because it's so popular. Um, but we're looking at some of her history here. For example, her team has done some research dealing with the oscillations of the solar magnetic field. They've basically found, if you look at her papers, um, that, that her team found that the sun, not only the, with its four magnetic, four magnetic poles, uh, also has, looks like two dynamos operating slightly out of sync with each other. And this is, create, this is creating a complex, uh, uh, a larger field. Um, also, the sun being the center of our solar system isn't just so uh, rotating on its axis, it's actually, it's got like a wobble, <laughs> a multi-millennial wobble, and, um, and, and, and it, that, that leads to other implications about the, uh, uh, the, the events that our, our planet goes through, at least as far as climate, in these larger, uh, on these larger cycles, okay? Um, and again, she has just a, a huge um, uh, history as far as her, her profession. Okay, and now this uh, website called The Burning Platform uh, has a section that also keeps up with the Grand Solar Minimum, and it uh, goes over her one of her more recent uh, speeches she did in the past year, uh, talking about the Super Grand Solar Minimum is, is upon us. I highly recommend you take a look at this, uh, at this presentation. It's available online. Professor Valentina Sarkova gave a presentation of her climate 
and the Solar Magnetic Field Hypothesis at the Global Warming Policy Foundation in October 2018. Uh, the information she unveiled should wake you up. Zarkova is one of the few that correctly predicted solar cycle 24 would be weaker than uh, cycle 23, and only two out of 150 models predicted this. So her, uh, her prediction was uh, spot on. Her models uh, have run at 93% accuracy, which is astounding, and her findings suggest a super grand solar minimum is on the cards beginning 2020 and running for 350 to 400 years. Now, I'm going to show you later, NASA has put an article out saying that there's going to be a cooling period um, that they haven't seen since 200 years ago. So they're being very conservative. Um, but the last time that uh, that anyone has seen these kind of numbers was at the Little Ice Age, and it's talking about how it dealt with the sun's uh, the sun's magnetic fields. Um, and then this this uh, this page just basically continues uh, with with the videos of her presentation talking about these complex solar cycles and how it lines up with periods of um, basically war. Uh, famine and starvation. Mm. Okay, so that's what's really important. If you know the solar cycle, you can predict. Um, you can basically predict the events that are uh, that are going to that are going to happen because of the main driver, which is our sun. Uh, so basically, with the grand solar minimum, with work with uh, from Dr. Zarkova and others. Um, what we're concluding is basically around 2020 there there will be observable shortages, but we're kind of seeing it now, especially with this past year, as far as the the extreme weather in the Midwest, the United States, and other places of flooding, and fr and frost in places that we we're not used to seeing. Um, but we're already seeing shortages in crops and changes in the climate due to this uh, grand solar cycle. Some estimates place 2025 as a period of major crop losses uh, globally, and historically a uh, global temperature decrease of 1.3 to 2 degrees centigrade has led to shorter seasons, food shortages, which in turn has led to mass migration and wars. And this is the global temperature dropping by, you know, by again 1.3 to 2 degrees centigrade. Um, now the data that she and other scientists now present point to a natural cycle and as a people, we, we have to learn to adapt. We have to see this is the real data, this is the natural cycle, and it's very important that we have this as a foundation so that now when you see the man-made global, the global climate change hoax or global warming hoax that they don't call it anymore, is how it's your fault, you have a reference point. See if they actually present any data showing, the, uh, showing otherwise. And, but, so now, now we're gonna go, go further talking about the damage just keep in mind that this now having this data, we're able to map um, the change in the climate. And you're going to have to think in the back of your head if only now we're actually piecing this together based on what real scientists and, uh, are, are, are finding with their models. Um, does the opposition, are there other interests out there that kind of know this was happening anyway and are trying to just play in us? Uh, making us as ill-prepared as possible so that they can take advantage. One thing I just want to say is I, I find it mind-blowing because the, the global warming hoax, I guess, which they're no longer calling it that, mm -hmm. now they're calling it climate crisis. Climate change. Right? Man-made cl climate change. Man-made climate change, which again we'll get into later. But the thing that's, it's, it's almost funny because they're saying everything's getting hotter. Yes. But the, the real climate change is that everything's getting colder. And extreme weather. And extreme weather. So it's kind of like the opposite. You have these, everything's getting hotter, global warming, but then you have like record low temperatures. So it's, yeah. it's what well, the reality is going in, in opposition <laughs> to what these, pe these, these propaganda artists are trying to put out there as far as, as uh, the climate, the man-made climate crisis. In fact, what you'll see is that. Um, it's kind of like proving them wrong in real time. I mean, right. yes. <laughs> well, because it's a hoax, they, they just said it's going to get warmer and warmer. And you think, well, if they were smarter, they would say, they, they wouldn't say warmer and warmer. They would say, it'll just get crazy. It's better you just said, it's just, we'll just get crazier weather. Right. And to make <laughs> us feel, you know, believe that we humans have something, some kind of control over yes. something like this. Yes. Right. And that, you know, why? So we'll get into that in a second. Yeah. But I just found that very funny. Okay. And then uh, we have this Zero Hedge article that, 
uh, came out in July, uh, devastating crop losses are literally happening all over the globe. And it's just dealing with um, basically the confirmation of this grand solar minimum uh, a hypothesis is taking hold. People are taking the data and, and, and uh, are looking at what's been happening uh, with the tally as far as this past year's um, crop losses around the world. Now, when I was researching this for our show tonight, um, I, I didn't think that I'd run across this, but someone by the name of Ice H. Farmer, um, by the way, I also, also think you should check out his YouTube channel, Ice H. Farmer, the Ice H. Farmer. He actually compiled a what is called a Grand Solar Minimum Crop Loss Map. So on this map, as you can see, there's all these markers where there's crop loss damage. So yeah, for example, there, Kenya, farmer record, 30% drop in wheat harvest. I mean, th these are massive drops. Ravages crops in Yemen, Oman. Extreme weather takes toll on Illinois crops and farms. Now, some of these actually have a reference link that if you click on it, it'll take you to the actual article. Coffee harvest hampered 3% by heavy rains. Christmas tree growers grapple to freeze damage in Nova Scotia. So we're expecting to see more and more of this as we get into the grand solar minimum where the, uh, the energy output from the sun uh, starts to wane. Now, when that happens, that almost like that shield we have from the sun uh, wanes also. So more cosmic radiation, uh, more cosmic rays starts to reach the earth. And when those rays reach the atmosphere of the earth, it causes cloud nucleation, causes cloud cover, and those clouds build up and cause more rains. Also what comes with that is extreme change in temperature in very short periods of time. Mm. Okay. So basically um, we have this extreme weather that has wiped out a ton of, a ton of crops. This article continues talking about the, um, the poor crop season in the Midwest. Basically this solar minimum ca it came early from the models of the scientists, that's what they expected if it's going to be a grand solar minimum. Uh, and they, this, this minimum, this cycle, is matched to what is called the Maunder minimum, which stretched from 1645 to 1715. Now, the article actually continues to uh, talk about what was happening during those times. Um, and it gives some examples. Now, someone that they actually asked for their opinion dealing with this was an economist named Martin Armstrong that is concerned about these cycles because economists also look at cycles and, 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 and graphs and, and they have to, uh, you know, it's very important for, for their profession. But to give an example, he mentions the Maunder minimum created such deep cold in Europe and extreme weather events elsewhere that what unfolds is a series of droughts, floods, and harvest failures. Historically, this leads to massive migrations, wars, and revolutions. Mm. The fatal synergy between human and natural disasters eradicated perhaps one-third of the human population during the last event. In this time, we're crashing more rapidly than before. Therefore, we may exceed more than a reduction in population of one-third and reach levels in the 14th century of 50%, which is almost combined with the Black Plague. So that is an example of the type of thing that that you can expect with a grand solar minimum and, and extreme changes in climate and changes or the inability to grow crops. Um, now this is the thing. That that's what a natural cycle does. You know, you don't need to have you don't need to have man made extinction happening because this is a natural cycle. So the question is, um, can we as a people prepare for it? Okay, and this article here, Electroverse, um, caught an article from NASA, nasa.gov. NASA predicts next solar cycle will be lowest in 200 years, Dalton minimal levels. Now the Dalton minimum was uh, circa 1790 to 1830. Okay, and Again, they're looking at the maximum of this, of, of this next cycle. It's, they're talking about cycle 25, which is to, to start around 2025. 
um, is measured in terms of sunspot number and that it could be the 30 to 50 percent lower than the most recent one, our current cycle 24. Okay, so sunspot activity is to be even lower. And you can see the graph there. Now you can see these large oscillations. You see it there in this graph going back to 1600. And again, this is as good as records can get. Um, now it goes back even farther with the computer simulations based on uh, geographical data. Um, but as you can see, there's these, there's these oscillations. It's not just a, it, it's a complex wave you see here. And you see the red hump that is what we're going, getting ready to go into as far as solar energy output. You see how low that is? That has dramatic effects on, on our climate. Okay, so the article continues, and again, it starts to cite. It starts to cite through what happens, um, what happened in the past, um, when, when we when we had these problems uh, with solar activity in the past, and matching it, matching the times of those weak spots in in the graph that you saw earlier, with these events that happened in the past. Okay. NASA attempts to paint the upcoming solar shutdown as a window of opportunity for space missions. The improving ability to make such predictions about space weather are good news for mission planners who can schedule human exploration missions during periods of lower radiation. <clears throat> this is absurd and serves as yet another example of government agency obfuscation and half-truths. NASA, which we think is never a straight answer, yeah. right? <laughs> Um, is effectively forecasting a return to the Dalton minimum, 1790 to 1830, but gives no mention of the brutal cold, crop loss, famine, and war, and powerful volcanic eruptions associated with it. And that's where it is, folks. These things are predicted because they know that this cycle is coming. Um, I mean, as far as space exploration, I'm, I'm neither here or there about that, but, you know, because the sun is weaker doesn't mean it's good. You've got cosmic radiation coming in that the sun is not buffering us from. Um, so, <laughs> we need to be prepared for the brutal cold and crop loss and find, use, use the technology we have um, to help us uh, with being able to wear, wear that out and obviously uh, be deep in prayer on that too. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the article continues uh, talking about the different events that have happened in the past, um, the Battle of Waterloo and what was happening during that time when they were expecting the, uh, for it to warm up and it never did during that summer, during the battle uh, with Napoleon. Um, there was earthquakes in the Indonesian islands. In the Americas, there's also extreme weather uh, as well. And I think this is interesting. Clothes froze on the line in New England, ice on the ponds, it lakes was reported uh, in the northwestern Pennsylvania in both July and August. Wow. Uh, and Virginia had frosts in August. The temperature occasionally got into the 90s, but then would drop to nearly freezing in just a few hours. Wow. So, so just remember that line. <laughs> you know, if it's 90s and then it goes to freezing in a few hours, um, can animals survive that? Can we survive that? Mm. One minute you're wearing a, a shirt and sleeve, you know, a short sleeve shirt and shorts, and next minute things start to freeze. So that movie, what was it, The Day After Tomorrow? I think it was The Day After Tomorrow. So, yeah. so that's, there's some kind of accuracy in that maybe? Like, well, that was kind of crazy. That was extreme, but the weather can really drop like that, huh? Well, I mean, if you're going from 90s to freeze to nearly freezing, let's say 40s, that's a 50-degree drop. Yeah, that's pretty extreme. So... Um, crops have managed to sprout, were frozen in early June, replanted, and froze again in July. Oh my gosh. Very few crops were actually harvested, and those that were, that were, the yields were very poor. In turn, food and grain prices skyrocketed. For example, in 1815, oats sold for 12 cents a bushel, but by next year, the bushel will set, will set you back 92 cents. So we're talking about sevenfold sevenfold increases in, in prices. Mm. That's inflation, and that's in 1815. So you read the rest of this article. I just wanted to show you some of the extremes that we could, you could see as kind of like a glimpse into the future, and that we need to be prepared for that and not think this stuff is too far out of the realm of possibility. 
um, because you know we we're, we we don't want people to die from um, disease and malnutrition and starvation if they know that you know this is the kind of stuff that we have to uh, prepare ourselves for. So that basically ends our uh, our, our discussion uh, this time for the grand seller minimum. We'll obviously talk more about this as uh, news unfolds um, because we know that. The opposition is going to be pushing very hard on uh, climate change and, and give you a false narrative about how it's your fault and how dare you, says Greta. And um, <laughs> <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> wow. Uh, <laughs> and let's bring that right into, um, so that's the real climate change. Yes, that's right. Right? Now let's talk about what crazy stuff they're doing with the fake climate change. Right. Yes. Yeah. Um, and this is all over the place. Um, the Extinction Rebellion mm -hmm. movement has been all over the news recently. So we've got a few uh, articles here that we want to discuss to show you, in contrast, the lunacy of what's going on out there right now. So last week in our current events show, we talked about how Greta. Thunberg was linked to George Soros funding. She has a handler. Well, this week, we're talking about more funding for these zealots. This is a Daily Mail. This just came out. How Extinction Rebellion climate change zealots, including a baronet's Cambridge edu educated granddaughter, are paid 400 pounds a week to bring mayhem to our streets. Wow, look at that. We'll just read the highlights here. Extinction Rebellion activists are being paid up to 400 pounds a week to lead protests. Activists have been paid more than 200,000 pounds since the start of the scheme. The eco-protest group privately fears it could face six-figure uh, tax bill from HMRC. And Tory MP calls on HMRC to launch an investigation into the group's tax affairs. So, all these crazy protests. Yeah, I mean, what are they doing? Uh, you know, the, when, when you when you see them in the news, they're always clowning around. You Look know, at they, this guy. This they, is, they're going yeah. to a, new, a municipal building. Um, I mean, I don't even know, know how with the zoning, how they're able to get away with that with like fire trucks with red paint, you know, to represent blood. You know, they start try to they try to spray the building with with the paint, just causing mayhem, just shutting down the city, trying to shut down parts of London. With their rhetoric, and who are these people? You, you know, are the death cult. Look at this death cult with the death mask and the skulls. They're, it just has Soros written all over it's, it. Yeah, they're they're paid agitators and protesters. There's so much here. Gail Bradbrook, the self-proclaimed neo-pagan who was inspired to create the eco protest group after taking psychedelic drugs, requests payments of six hundred pounds a month this year so they're so they're not <laughs> volunteers they're paid they're paid they're not volunteers they're not there for they're just they're just creating havoc so we've done stuff on this before in the right. past where we're showing you it's like you got these protesters and they're out there let me see if i can find a picture of all of them here we go this is the picture i was looking for it's all these like artistic looking they're in red and there was other ones in green this is very very culty and what a production you know how much should those cost well they're all paid look at the looks on their faces they're w extinction rebellion what are they rebelling against that they're going to be extinct uh, it's just i don't know yeah i don't know <laughs> anyway uh it's got everybody in an uproar and we just found out that they're all getting paid so i mean how much more proof do you really need yeah come on you know, and anytime somebody comes at me with, oh, you know, climate change, it's real and it's all your fault and you need to stop, you know, using this, that, or whatever. It's like, Ugh. yeah, I've seen the science yeah. and it doesn't add up. I've right. also seen your propaganda and that adds up and that, that tells me that you're trying to, you know, defraud the public. This is an agenda. It's an agenda. So anyway, there's that. Mm-hmm. Oh, so what's this? So this goes back to Greta Thunberg because what we have discovered is that she also works for this. She's employed by this organization as well called we don't have time dot org. What this is is an app that is backed by 400 major multinational companies. 
This app will be used to police companies, institutions, and people by their ecological footprint. Oh. So this is where we tie it in to what we talked about in the beginning of the show, talking about China's mm -hmm. social media score, um, the facial recognition, mm -hmm. and how they're being penalized. They can't travel. They can't do this. They mm -hmm. can't do that. This app is basically being set up to collect data on people in mm -hmm. order to penalize them based on their carbon footprint. Let's take a, a deeper look into some of the things that they're saying about this app. Okay, this is a great blog from wrongkindofgreen.org. Uh, the manufacturing of Greta Thunberg for consent, the political economy of the nonprofit industri industrial complex. Uh, I'm just going to scroll down uh, to here's see here's Greta working for We Don't Have Time. But I'm going to scroll down to this part that gives a brief description. Uh, that I find quite alarming. It says, we don't have time software app, the latest wave of Western and corporate ideology at your fingertips. In October 2016, Netflix aired the third season of Black Mirror, a Twilight Zone-esque anthology TV series about technological anxieties and possible futures. The first episode, Nosedive, posts a shallow and hypocritical populace in which social platforms, self-curation, and validation seeking have become the underpinning of a future society. Black Mirror's third season opens with a vicious take on social media. The disturbing episode shares parallels to the concept behind we don't have time. The difference being, instead of rating people exclusively, we will be rating brands, products, corporations, and everything else climate related. Here is, looks like a, something from inside their, their app system. It says, rally around a cause. Our system will be designed to highlight this and prompt businesses, politicians, and other leaders to act. If, for instance, 500 users object to the use of plastic bags in a local convenience store, the manager of that store will receive an automatically generated email from the platform and the store's overall we don't have time rating will be negatively affected. However, if the store goes on to do something about it, our users will appreciate this and improve the store's rating. Do you see the problem there? Um, yes, it's relying on a platform to, well, to social engineer um, through a rating scheme. This, this can be, this can so easily be abused. Oh, absolutely. This will shut down businesses. Mm -hmm. Do you understand how that would happen? I mean, you've got, you're, okay, here, let's, let's get a scenario, right? You're like a little small mom and pop. You open up a pizza parlor, mm -hmm. right? And then somebody decides that they're going to target you and mm -hmm. target your business and get all their crazy, radical, zealot friends who don't have jobs, don't work for a living, they're all getting paid by some Soros Foundation mm -hmm. to say, we've decided that we're going to boycott pepperoni, mm -hmm. right? And pepperoni is like your biggest selling pizza slice and you, you know, that's your, that's your bread and butter, pun intended, right? It's like, yeah. that's what allows you to pay your, your business bills and all of a sudden they have the social rating score and they all say you have to get rid of your pepperoni and replace it with some other kind of something mm -hmm. and the store manager is now being forced to make a business decision not because it's illegal to have pepperoni or it's some kind of you know violation or of some kind of rule or law that makes sense but because a mob of misinformed people yeah. have decided they're going to put you out of business by shutting down your number one product. Do you see, like, that's yes. just an example yeah. of yeah. how it can happen. There's, like, so many scenarios that can play out. True. But you put this, it's, it's basically allowing mobs to gang up on individual people. Yes, but it's for the environment, so it's okay. Uh, it's, it's control. Mm -hmm. it's, con it's just, it's awful. It's awful on so many levels. And I'll, I said it before and I'll say it again, anytime I see any kind of climate crisis where they're trying to say, we have to stop doing things because there's too much CO2 and it's all our mm -hmm, fault, mm -hmm. I always go straight to this agenda. Yes. Agenda 2030. Yeah. The, the, the green, the new green deal. Right. And I, at the end of it, 
is population control. Yes, at the, end, at of the end of it, is trying to kill off as many people as they can. Yes. That's the agenda. I always see that when I see people doing these crazy things. Let's talk about the New Green Deal. Okay. Right. So the New Green Deal is a proposed United States legislation that aims to address climate change and economic inequality. The name refers to the New Deal, a set of social and economic reforms and public works projects undertaken by President Franklin D. Roosevelt in response to the Great Depression. The New Green Deal combines the Roosevelt's economic approach with modern ideas such as renewable energy and resource efficiency as defined by Wikipedia. When we talk about the Green New Deal, um, basically think of it as the roadmap to Agenda 2030. The idea is by 2030, um, the goal is to have all the countries in the world operating under uh, net zero carbon emissions that, you know, there's, there'll be no fossil fuel, there'll be no gas guzzling cars, it will just be everything with, with solar panels and, and windmills and, I mean, when they say net zero carbon, I'm not sure how that's supposed to work because we're carbon based. Well, that, sounds, forms. that and, sounds great, though. And we emit carbon dioxide, mm -hmm. so, so wh Why, what is net zero? But, but you know, this, mean? it sounds so pretty. The way they pitch it, it sounds yes. so pretty. But everything that they, that they pitch that's inherently evil has this, this overtone. It's, it's sugar-coated. Yes. And, it's, and they use big fancy words that make it sound like, oh, that sounds, you know, benevolent. That sounds like a good thing. And, and but why, why, why is it not a good thing? Oh well, um, because it's not it's not achievable at, in in a society. In it would basically, and they would admit the incentives to do it would lead you into a road basically leading us to what we're talking about at the beginning of this program dealing with uh, communism. Mm -hmm. You'd have to socially control the population um, uh, in order to do it, and even then, people because of the way they want to engineer it people would end up dying because uh, it, you, you, you'd, ha you'd be for the sake of the environment. So I wanted to read through some of the, some of the Green New Deal, um, basically to get an idea of the language that's used to promote it, okay? Because this is, this is, how, this is how they want you to think um, based on how, how it's being presented. The National Green Party platform calls for the following. Enact an emergency Green New Deal to turn the tide on climate change. Revive the economy and make wars for oil obsolete. Uh, initiate a World War II scale national mobilization. You know, they always have to evoke the, the previous war, World War II. To halt climate change, the greatest threat to humanity in our history. Uh, create 20 million jobs by transitioning to 100% clean renewable energy by 2030. Again, that date, 2030. Mm -hmm and investing in public transit, sustainable regenerative agriculture, conservation, and restoration of critical infrastructure, including ecosystems. You know, that I sounds to, great. I have to stop you right there, because this is a pet peeve of mine, because okay. of the work that we do, mm -hmm. all right? Uh, transitioning to 100% clean renewable energy by 2030. <laughs> Bullshit. <laughs> Okay? If that were true, then you would stop censoring all the free energy patents. That's true, yeah. We've had free energy since 1920. Yeah, at least. At least. And they're all censored and tucked away, and they just act like, oh, it doesn't exist, it's not possible. Instead, let's make these humongous wind turbines. That, that, that create a lot of infrasound. That only yeah. last for 25 years before they're dead. Yes. You know, those, it's like, it's, um, and... Anyway, I, it's it's a problem. It's I I just I think I'm allergic to lies. <laughs> You're allergic to bullshit. <laughs> I'm allergic to bullshit and lies. It's like you have to. Here's the here's the trick, okay? In order to understand all of this, you literally have to flip your brain inside out. Yeah. Because that's the only way. It, you realize that everything that they accuse other people of is them projecting. So when they say extinction, they're projecting that that's what they want to do to the rest of the population. Yes. Okay. So, and so anyway, so let's go ahead and keep reading. <laughs> <laughs> so they want to implement a just transition that empowers those communities and workers most impacted by climate change 
and their transition to a green economy ensure that any worker displaced by the shift away from fossil fuels will receive full income and benefits as they transition to alternative work, as they transition to alternative work. So they'll be receiving income even though they're not actually employed. Does that sound like universal income to me? Yeah. Very, very communist. Enact energy democracy based on public, community, and worker ownership. But where is the individual in that? Of our energy system. <laughs> Treat energy as a human right. Now, if it's a human right and rights are given, then rights can be taken. Taken away. Yeah. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. um, redirect research funds from fossil fuels into renewable energy and conservation. Build a nationwide smart electricity grid that can pull and store power from a diversity of renewable sources, giving the nation clean and democratically controlled energy. Now, what does that mean? Okay, we, uh, we're going to touch on this briefly because we, we're doing like a whole series of shows just about this. Yes. Okay, the smart electricity grid. Yes. Okay, smart meters are giving people cancer. Mm. 5G is a big flipping problem. And this Extinction Rebellion mm -hmm. is, has been, is, I think it's been puffed up mm -hmm. just to make everybody stop talking about 5G. Did you notice mm. how 5G was all over the place? Yeah, everybody was talking about the dangers of 5G. Yeah. May, June, July, yes. everybody was talking about 5G. Mm -hmm. You know, we got a lot of hits on our stuff because we do f yeah. some 5G things. And then all of a sudden, the whole 5G story got dropped like a hot potato by a lot of these platforms. Yes, yeah. But people are still doing interviews on it. They're still talking about it. There's yes. still evidence coming out about how dangerous 5G is and how bad it is. Indeed. And it's being censored. Yeah. They don't want you to know. They're like, no, no, don't, don't look at the 5G. Don't think about the fact that we're getting ready to microwave the population. Yeah. Okay, microwave. But you, you got It's not good for us. <laughs> But it's good for the earth. It's zero, zero net like, carbon. 5G is a great thing. No, it's not. And smart grids are not good things. All of this new technology is not safe for people. And whew, there's, there's a lot to say about it. And so we've got reports and we've got evidence and proof and all the scientific studies. We're gathering all that stuff. We've got a lot of it gathered already. We've done some shows on it already. It's out there. Yes, that's right. So... Basically, you can keep reading on, but basically, um, you, you can see how the delivery, you know, um, for someone who's not looking too deeply into this, sounds attractive, um, but they don't talk about how is it going to be managed and controlled, who's going to be in control to, to exert uh, their will over the population that decides to refuse and how it would be done. I see the Communist Manifesto woven into this thing. Absolutely. So that's, that's basically it for uh, the Green New Deal. That's all you really need to know is, is that what I just read is being shared around the world um, as the means, uh, as the roadmap for, adapt, for Agenda 2030. So I found uh, this article just basically explain what Agenda 2030 is. And basically, it's uh, the UN Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development. It just basically talks about how since 2015, um, it, was, it came into being in 2015 that Agenda 21, there's these meetings uh, going back into the 70s with trying to uh, talk with these countries, trying to decide with among the member states how to come towards this goal of sustainability and helping the environment and diminishing inequality and ending extreme pro poverty in a very ambiguous way, which is why they kept having all these meetings and in, in, in for like leading to Agenda 21 and now it's been turned into Agenda 2030. At the end of the day, what ends up happening is that they're formed another group called the United Nations Millennium Development Goals, or MDGs, um, as a blueprint for the governments to decide how they want to best continue with this UN Sustainable Development uh, 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 Agenda. Uh, there's a series of summits that happened, um, but basically what they're finding is, you know, this, this, this Thing go, this article goes on to explain how um, America and Russia and, and, and other countries, but mainly those two, are kind of slow in trying to initiate and, and go through this with this agenda. They never mention China. They never mention China. Oh, yeah. We forgot to mention that part, too. Yeah. China's that, never mentioned They don't any touch of these. China 
at all. Meanwhile, China is the biggest polluter of them all. China is the biggest polluter. China is the exporter of the communist model. Mm -hmm. um, Greta won't talk about China. Greta won't talk about they China. They don't talk about China when China is the biggest polluter of them I mean, all. Why? Because they're on the other side. Exactly. They're on, they're on the other team. They're, they're not for the people. This is communist in its very nature. And of course they would support China. Yeah, Extinction Red is wearing, they're already, uh, Extinction Red, <laughs> Extinction Rebellion is wearing red. I mean, they just need to have the, the, the star on, on the shoulder somewhere. But, yeah, or the hammer and sickle. The right? hammer and sickle. <laughs> and and they, they got it. Um, but basically, so Agenda 2030 is, is just, uh, is, if I'll summarize it, it's the goal for depopulation, um, but it's hiding under the vehicle of finding ways to create a more sustainable earth and ending extreme poverty and helping the environment and diminishing inequality. Um, so it's a broad plan that hasn't really been fleshed out, but the vehicle for that, the roadmap, is the Green New Deal. Okay? The Green New Deal is supposed to be that roadmap. And so that's why we're seeing all the stuff that we're seeing right now, all the propaganda, all the paid activists and protesters. That's all part of the Green New Deal. Yes. Which is a part of the roadmap to Agenda 2030. And so the argument we're putting forward is this Agenda 2030, the Green New Deal, is the Communist Manifesto coming in through the environment. It's about the environment. If you don't agree with it, if you don't agree that it's man-made, because again, what does it come down to? Uh, fear, uh, projecting fear and suppression and exerting uh, this control over the, over the general population that it's their fault and, and, and you need to be controlled. So with all that said, we do want to end this on a, on a high note. Ah, right? <laughs> <laughs> but because what we do with our business and our organization, it's, it's about solutions. So right. it's like, yes, these are real problems. Yes, there's a lot of corruptions uh, going on with this stuff. But the, but the best thing you can do is inform yourself. Yep. Like we're trying to help you guys. We're trying to show you the articles and inform yourself about what's really going on. Like I said earlier, flip your brain inside out, look at things from a different perspective, and realize that everybody, we're bathed in lies. Yes, okay? Right. So everything that they say, you have to look into their background, you have to see where they're coming from, what kind of financial ties do they have, are they being funded by somebody, right. and whatever they say is usually the opposite of the truth. So if you look at it with a flipped inside out perspective, then you can probably make out what reality is, what the truth is. And it even says in the Bible, mm -hmm. you know, there's going to come a time when they call evil good and good evil. They call bitter sweet and they call sweet bitter and light is dark and dark is light and everything's upside down, right? We were told about this. Yes. So the thing that, you, yes, inform yourself, but also there are solutions that you can implement. A lot of these like survival skills mm -hmm. that people are trying to teach others, um, are a part of it. Like, for example, the um, I notice a lot of people sell these like emergency food supply packs. Yes, <laughs> yeah, that's it. With like freeze dried carbs, you know. Um, <laughs> and it's all right. I mean, if you're into carbs, but Tavon and I, we we stopped eating uh, carbs and sugar. Uh, gosh, nine months ago. Yeah. We went on a like a keto paleo kind of food plan and uh, stopped it and we feel much better because we don't do the carb thing. But what I'm saying is, is that I think it would be, it would be better to teach people how to can food. Yes. You know, instead as, of, as, as a prepper pack. Yeah. Instead of selling like the, um, the freeze dried food, like teach people how to can, sell canning equipment, canning equipment, you know, can your own food, dehydrate your own food, grow your own food, learn how to process. It's a lot of work. We do it. It's a lot of work. And also you'll be helping out American businesses. Literally. I think it's, I think America is one of the few countries that actually exclusively makes canning equipment yeah. for pres food preservation. Yeah. Well, we, we live in Morocco and I had to get my canning stuff all from America. I yeah. have it all shipped in, you know. I don't, I don't know. I don't know anybody around me that does any canning, but it's been wonderful. Yes, it's been wonderful because I know what goes in that jar, and you learn the the science behind it. It's an it's an old thing, mm -hmm. um, and it's not just jams and jellies and pickles. You can you can can meats, you can can vegetables, you yeah. can can meals for your family. And how long do they last for? Well, they say it will last maybe a year, maybe up to four years. Yeah. We've seen people open up jars 
that are 20 years old and it still smells like it was canned just the day before and don't yeah. have to be scared about botulism and all that stuff because just educate yourself on how to do it properly and there's tons of videos so that's just an example that's an example of a solution for these things it's just to be self-sufficient and have skills and have knowledge and you'll get through no matter what happens and also we would recommend praying yes Yes. Believe in God and pray and seek out the Lord. Yes. And you will find him and you will get the answers and the protection that you need. Very nice. So with that said, we will see you next week for another Real Speaks Current Events show. And also tune in this coming Thursday for our next show on 5G, 5G Watch. Watch. We'll be covering some new topics on 5G and the dangers and what you guys need to be prepared. Yep. See you next time. See you.